Thank you. So, and I'm hoping that we've got the, um, the technical difficulties worked out and it's not going to blink this time. So this is um, more, uh, uh, more mathematical, less, uh, uh, less applications. Well, first of all, I'm only, um, I'm only going to talk about dense graphs. So these are graphs where the number of edges is of order n squared. And we learned last time that um, these kinds of networks are well modeled by graphs, that a lot of relevant networks are well modeled by graphs. So now we're, we're going to learn um, uh, what, what we can do to look at very large graphs. And, um, and this work started, um, I, I may have mentioned this, this, this work started uh, about five or six years ago when we asked some graph theorists and some combinatorialists, how do you, um, how do you calculate properties of very, very large graphs. There must be some limit of graphs that makes it easier, and there wasn't. So then we started to ask, well, what would it mean for a sequence of graphs to be a convergent sequence? And we came up with about five or six different ways of looking at it, and we showed that they were all the same as each other, at least in the, in the dense case. So that's, that's what I'm going to be telling you about. This is joint work with Christian, with Latsi Lovas, with uh, 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 Vera Shoj, and with uh, Kadi Vestragambi. Okay, so the first part is testing a large graph with small graphs, and the second part I think of more as testing um, a, a small graph with large graphs. Okay, which is more like a stat mech way of looking at things. So this all comes from the first way of, of looking at it. So as we learned last time, there are many examples of growing graph sequences, the internet, the World Wide Web, large online social networks. And we want a succinct but faithful representation of those networks so that we can test properties such as clustering. And so that, you know, if we wanted to do, let's say, page rank, we would have a way of sampling the graph and doing page rank on a sample or calculating page rank on something that was um, some kind of a limit of the graphs. Okay, and as I said, we're only going to deal with dense graphs. We do have some, uh, uh, some results with Christian and Lotzi and Jeff Kahn for um, things like ZD, but we don't have uh, uh, any results for something like a preferential attachment graph, okay, which is not dense but does have some, uh, some vertices with uh, many, many neighbors. Okay, so, um, so given a sequence of graphs, of finite graphs, um, the kinds of questions we want to ask are um, what is the right notion of convergence? Okay, so if you started to think about it, what would the right notion of convergence be? And of course, you can think of lots of different notions. If your notions are too weak, then you know um, everything will converge, but you won't get you know anything very interesting out of it. If your notions are are too strong, then nothing will will converge. So, what is the right notion of convergence of graphs? Um, if we can get a notion of convergence, can we come up with a metric so that in that metric, a sequence of graphs which converges in a reasonable way is Cauchy in that metric? And what is the limit object? So those are some of the first questions that we want to look at. So testing. Um, in, in CS, uh, a lot of people think about testing. And so... Um, a simple graph parameter is a real valued function on simple graphs. So these are graphs with no self loops and only one edge um, running from one um, node to a second node, no, uh, uh, no, uh, uh, no multi edges, and invariant, um, invariant under, uh, 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 under um, isomorphism. Okay, so. Under what conditions is such a function testable? In the sense that if I took 
a sample, a large enough sample of the points. And I looked at the graph that was induced on those points. So I kept all the edges on, those, on that set of points. And I looked at the function on that induced graph. I wanted to be close to the function on the entire graph. So more precisely, a simple graph parameter is testable if there's a large enough k such that if I look at all, um, all induced graphs on k vertices, the value of the function on the graph is close to the value of the function, the, the, the value of the function on the induced graph, on this smaller graph, is close to the value of the function with large probability. Okay, so how close it is, well I might have to, if I want it really close, I may have to take a, a, larger, um, a larger induced graph. Okay, so um, Merrick was involved in one of the early, um, uh, one of the um, early examples of, of a um, testable um, graph parameter that people care about. That's max cut, so if you look at a graph and you ask what is the value of the maximum cut, so you ask, you know, you add up all the edges on a cut and you ask what's the maximum of that and then you look for the density of that. That turns out to be a testable graph parameter, okay? So if you take a large enough sample size, then you can calculate the max cut density on that sample. Okay? And it's really not obvious that you're always going to pick up that maximum cut. Okay? There's their structure in large graphs that people hadn't realized is, is there. Okay, and so then we, we also want to ask, is testability in some way, um, in some way related to, uh, uh, to convergent graph sequences, okay? So the preview is that there is a reasonable notion of convergent graph sequences, and it turns out to be the same as convergence in some metric, and so a lot of the talk will be coming up with that metric, and it's closely, um, closely related to sampling and to testing. Okay, so some of the main theorems are that um, a function will converge on, um, on a convergent graph sequence if and only if it has continuity in the metric that we're gonna be coming up with, if and only if it's a testable graph parameter, and if and only if it can be extended smoothly to an object on, to, to a function on the limit object, okay? So finally, I'm starting out with what the, the definition of convergence is, what our first, um, first definition was, which I think is the, um, kind of the most obvious one to, to us at least. So, um, F and G are both simple graphs. I wanna think of F as something small like an edge or a triangle or a four cycle. And I want to think of G as some large graph. And a homomorphism is a map such that edges, such that um, if, if two nodes have an edge in, in, in F, then they have an edge in G, okay? And subgraph densities, uh, Erdős and Lovas, and Spencer, in 1979, looked at subgraph densities, which were the number of homomorphisms. So just think of like the number of triangles, okay? So this is the probability that if I choose some random triangle, okay, that a random map from the vertex set of the triangle to the vertex set of G is a homomorphism. Okay, and I better normalize by the right thing. I better normalize by n, the number of vertices in my big graph, to the size of my small graph. So, for example, T of the triangle is the triangle density of, of G. Okay? So, we, we call the first notion of convergence left convergence. And what we ask is that what, what, what we say is that a sequence is left convergent if all of the densities converge. So I have a sequence of graphs. I ask that the density of edges converges. I ask that the density of triangles, the density of four cycles, 
the density of Peterson graphs, all finite graphs, converge. Okay? And that's a very local notion of convergence. All the, all the little pieces of the graph should, testing by all these little pieces, we should be getting this, the same thing. Those, those should be tending to a limit. Okay, so for example, if I look at the random graph on n vertices, okay, where each edge is there and not randomly with a uniform probability p, then the, um, the density, for example, of, of edges is just p, the density of triangles is p cubed, the density of four cycles is p to the fourth, okay? So that... That certainly is a, a convergent graph sequence, but in fact, things that are a lot less regular than the random graph are convergent graph sequences. Okay, so that's a reasonable notion. It's a very local notion. Now what we want is we want to come up with a metric on graphs, so a way to test if two graphs are close to each other, and then hope that the convergent graph sequences will be Cauchy in that metric. Okay, so we go back to 1999. Fries and Conin came up with what they called a cut norm on matrices. So they looked at an, M, at an N by N matrix, and they maximized over two subsets. And just the reason that they were calling it the cut is if you think of T as S complement, okay, and you're maximizing all of the edge weights, Okay, the sum of all of the edge weights, that would, that would be what you might call a cut norm. Okay, but in general, we can do this for two separate subsets, S and T, and it differs by like a factor of four or something. Okay, so this is the cut norm of the matrix M. Okay, so now the, the next thing that I want to do is come up with a notion of what it means for two graphs on the same number, um, the same number of nodes to be close to each other, okay? So I take weighted graphs on the set one up through n. I want them to have common vertex weights, okay? So, you know, the weight of vertex one is alpha one, weight of vertex i is alpha i, but they have different edge weights. So G has edge weights, uh, uh, edge weights beta ij, and G prime has edge weights uh, uh, beta prime ij. And then if I look at the matrix of that graph, the adjacency matrix of that graph, the element ij is just alpha i, beta ij, um, alpha j, okay? And let me look at the cut norm, normalized, of the matrix of one graph minus the matrix of the other graph. So what I'm doing is I'm looking at the, the cuts of the difference of the two graphs. Okay? And so this is just by the definition of, of what the cut norm is. Okay. Okay. So we've got a problem with it in that if I have two graphs and I relabel them, I won't get zero for the distance. And I really want to get zero for the distance, so what do I do? I just minimize overall relabelings. Okay? And now, if I take the same graph and I relabel it, obviously the distance is going to be zero because I just minimized over all the relabels. Okay? But what if I had two graphs with, um, with different vertex sets? Okay? Because I'm going to want to be comparing them if I'm comparing a growing graph sequence. So... What do I do if I have different vertex sets? What I want to do is I want to split each vertex of the graph G into n prime pieces, and each vertex of the graph G prime into n pieces, okay? So that I'll now have in both of them n times n prime vertices, okay? So how am I going to do that? Well, if I have a graph, um, with weights uh, uh, alpha i on the nodes and beta ij on the edges. Then for the nodes, I'm going to take each node of G, and let's say n prime is 3, I'll split it into three pieces, okay? And 
I'm going to take alpha i, which was the weight on that node, and I'm going to split it into three pieces, okay? So if the weight of the node was five, you know, I'll have one b1, one b2, one b3, whatever. Or, well, no, one b1, one b2, and, and another b2, okay? Um, okay. So this is what I do with the nodes. What do I do with the edges? If I had an edge in my graph, now I'm going to have a lot of edges in the new graph. So what do I do? Well, I take the edge and I replace it by a complete bipartite graph. So what's happened is that I has gotten blown up into n pieces and J has gotten blown up into n pieces with different weights that add up to the weight. And so what do I do? Well, I just put a complete bipartite graph on it with beta ij on every piece, okay? And what's nice about this, well, what's nice about it is that I have a new graph on n times n prime vertices and the density of edges, the density of triangles, the density of four cycles is the same. And it doesn't matter how I, how I divide it. I mean, you, you, you can just check this from, from the definitions. So it's invariant under this blowing up, okay? So now if I have two graphs, one with weights um, uh, alpha i um, and beta ij and the other with weights um, alpha prime and beta prime such that the total weights of the two are the same, then our cut metric is going to be the minimum over all ways of, um, of partitioning the weights on the vertices. And these are actually just couplings because, you know, the marginals of these x's are just alpha i or, um, um, or alpha u prime, okay? So these are couplings of the two of them and I'm minimizing over all of these. So it was kind of obvious that I should minimize over all the relabelings and this is a generalization of that, to minimize over all the couplings, all the different ways of um, taking those weights and breaking them up. Okay, and this is what I'm going to call my cut metric on graphs. And so um, if, if we have a sequence, um, a sequence of simple graphs, we say that G is convergent in the cut metric, obviously, if it's a Cauchy sequence in that metric. And the first theorem is that um, it's the same thing to have something which is Cauchy in this metric, a sequence which is Cauchy in this metric, or a sequence for which all the densities converge, the edge density, the triangle density, and, and so on. So although these cuts seem to be measuring really big things, okay, you know, you're looking at the maximum cut of the difference of these two graphs, and the other thing is measuring very local properties, they really are measuring the same thing. They're measuring the same thing really due to the fact that there is a regular structure to large graphs. So, and, and that's actually something very deep, that there's a regular structure to large graphs. So the subgraph densities of the sequence of graphs converge only if the sequence is Cauchy in the cut metric. Okay, so let me try to give you some idea of why this is true. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you first about graph averages. So I'm going to take a simple unweighted graph and I'm going to break up its vertex set into Q sets. Okay, so I'm going to take these N vertices and break them up into Q sets, Q sets of vertices. Okay, and then I'm going to define an edge density from class I to class J as the average edge density from the vertices in class I to the vertices in class J, okay? So I'm going to take it and I'm just going to blur it out. I'm, I'm, I'm going to average it, okay? And then I'm going to define what I call the average graph by saying that the edge weights of the average graph are just these blurred weights, okay? These, these average weights. And the Semoretti lemma, and the, the Semoretti le lemma is really, really deep. I mean, it is a lot of, I think, some of the, the most um, interesting things that have been proved in 
graph theory and things that are related to compressed sensing, like the matrix completion problem and stuff, have been proved using the Samaretti lemma, which is telling you that if you have a really large graph, there is an underlying structure to that graph that you might not realize. That's there just for combinatorial reasons, because you can't have something that big without some structure. And that's, I think, you know, in Tao's lecture at the ICM, I don't know when it was, like six years ago or something, he talks a lot about the Semaretti lemma and, and how there is really um, so much in the fact that there has to be some structure there. And Semaretti actually proved his lemma for, uh, 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 for number theory, for looking for patterns in primes, but it also tells you about patterns in large systems. And so I'm just going to tell you the weak version of the Semaretti uh, lemma, which was actually proved by Fries and Kahnen, but I'm going to state it in a way that they didn't state it, which I think makes it really um, obvious what's going on. So the weak regularity lemma says that for all simple graphs, there is a partition of the vertices of that graph into Q classes. And it's a, a pretty big number. It's 4 to the 1 over epsilon squared, and epsilon's going to come in in a minute, but that's a pretty big number, such that the, the cut metric of my graph to the average graph averaged over that partition is less than epsilon. So that is a very good approximation. And this is not a random graph. This is just a large graph. So for combinatorial reasons, okay, this happens. And the, um, the non-weak regularity lemma, and then there's a strong one, <laughs> um, has the number of partitions as a tower in epsilon. So the weak one, you know, it's a much smaller number, okay? But this is just saying, if I have a large graph, there's some graph out there which is an average version of my graph, much smaller than my graph, still big, but much smaller than my graph, which is really close to my graph in this metric that we've come up with. Okay, so sampling. So um, now if I look at a graph and, and I have a graph on, on K nodes, um, sorry, if I... Okay. Um, if I look at a graph, there exists a graph on K nodes, or I can take K, K nodes and, and sample K, K nodes from my graph and look at the induced graph, and it turns out that my graph is very close. How close? Like 1 over square root of log k close to that sampled graph with large probability, okay? So my actual graph, and this, this metric allows me to compare a big graph to a small graph, okay? And it says that my graph is close to the induced graph on this randomly chosen set of k points with very large probability, okay? So why is this true? The key elements of, of the proof. First of all, if I was lucky enough that my graph was an average graph, okay, that my graph was constant over a, a, um, a partition, then it would be easy to prove this. Now, what Samaretti tells me is that I can approximate my graph by one of these averaged graphs, this still doesn't tell me how I can compare the sampled version of my graph to the sampled version of the average graph. And so actually, Marek and some other folks showed that the Semaretti approximation is, um, um, is respected under the sampling. Okay, And that's not a trivial argument at all. Okay, So we use that. We'd actually proved that, and then we realized that they had proved it earlier. But it was one of the technically harder parts of, of the theorem. 
Okay, so now why is theorem one true? Why does convergence in the cut metric, why is there convergence in the cut metric if and only if all these densities, edge density, triangle density, and so on, uh, 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 settle down? Okay, well, by the triangle inequality, theorem two tells me that two gla graphs are close in metric only if their sampled versions are close. So I take k points and I, you know, and I look at um, one graph on, um, on the induced, you know, one sampled graph on these k points, and I look at the other one sampled on these k points, and their, their, their samples must be close in, in metric. And then the thing is that the, the subgraph frequencies are very much like the sampling probabilities, okay? If I pick, you know, uniformly three points, okay, the triangle density is like the probability that my sampled graph will be a triangle, okay? And so that's, that's what's really going on. It's that you get from the subgraphs to the densities via sampling, and sampling respects all of this, and then lots of work gives you that, um, I mean, so, so, so there are a lot of I's to dot and T's to cross, but really it's because sampling is telling you something, um, something about these densities, and Samoretti is telling you that there is structure there, that there, is, there are graphs out there that are averaged graphs that are close to, to your graph, which Samoretti was using to show that there are certain patterns in the primes. Okay, um, uh, parameter testing. So um, just, just to go over it, a graph parameter is a real valued function on a simple graph that's invariant under relabeling of the points. And um, a simple graph parameter is testable if and only if um, the, the function is very close on the, uh, the, the, the function measured on the whole graph is close to the function measured on the sample graph with large probability. Okay, so the next theorem was that um, let f be a, a simple graph parameter. So this relates now. So, so far we've, we've got that subgraph convergence is like convergence in these metrics. It's also like being able to test simple graph parameters. Because f is testable turns out to be the same as that for all convergent graph sequences, f of that sequence is convergent. So things are going to be testable if and only if they settle down on the convergent sequences. And this is almost continuity in the metric case that we have to ensure that we have a large enough number of nodes. Okay, so basically what this is saying is that if, if the um, graphs are close, then the function on the graphs is, is going to be close. Okay, so some examples of testable graph parameters. Well, first of all, all of the densities are testable graph parameters, okay? These are functions which are invariant under relabeling of the points. They're real value functions invariant under relabeling of the points, edge density, triangle density, such and such. These are testable. Um, we learned from Merrick's work that the max cut density is testable. And it turns out by part two of this work, every bias multi-way max cut density. So you can say, you know, I want something to be broken up into five sets with this percentage of the points and that one, that percentage of the points and the other one, and weightings on the sets and everything, and it's close to stat mech models, actually. All of those turn, all of those densities turn out to, to be testable. Okay, so the, the limit object. Well, okay, by theorem one, um, something is left convergent, that is, all of the densities are convergent, if and only if it's convergent in the metric. So there must exist some limit object. The question is, is there a useful representation of the limit object? And actually, it turned out um, that Fries and Conan, in that same paper in which they had proved the, uh, uh, the, 
um, the weak, um, weak sem ready lemma had also constructed this thing. They just hadn't thought of it in these terms. So a graphon, but Lotzi Lovas named these graphons. A function on the unit square, a real valued function on the unit square, which is measurable and such that w of x and y is w of y and x, really thinking of these as edges on a graph and such that it's bounded is called a graphon. And so, you know, if I, if I took my graph and I represented it as a matrix so that whenever an edge was in there, I would, you know, put some weight on that part of the matrix. Now if I took that matrix and I just looked at it as a function on the unit square and I said, you know, I'll just have the height of that function be the weight of the edge, okay, that would be a graph on, okay? So the, the indicator function of the edge set of a graph is a graph on, okay? And so if I have K nodes, I can say that the density of, let's say, a triangle is the integral of this W function, you know, WX to Y, WY to Z, WZ to X, okay, integrated over X, Y, and Z. And the theorem of Lovas and, uh, uh, and Balaj um, is that G is convergent if and only if there's a graph on, such that these T's converge to some function. So these GNs, which you can represent as a matrix and then represent it as a step function on the unit square, converge to some measurable function, measurable, um, uh, measurable uh, uh, symmetric bounded function. Okay, so other results on graphons. Using the notion of a cut norm, we were able to prove a version of theorem one, which is a, a convergence in metric, and theorem three, the, the testing um, theorem in terms of graphons. And also, one thing that actually turned out to be very hard to prove that we proved with Lotzi um, a couple of years after we proved the other stuff was that up to a measure-preserving transformation on the unit interval, these, you know, there's, there's only one representation of the graphon, okay? Now, a measure-preserving transformation does a lot, but the measure-preserving transformation is the, the, the measure-preserving transformation on the unit interval is the analog of the isomorphism, okay? So you can relabel your points, which is a measure-preserving transformation on the unit interval. The, the problem with all of this is that there are sets of measure zero that are really ugly to deal with here, okay? But it makes a lot of sense from, uh, uh, from an intuitive point of view that this would be the analog of the isomorphism. Okay, so there is a reasonable notion of convergence of graph sequences, which is convergence of subgraph densities. It turns out to be the same thing as, um, uh, as convergence in this cut metric and it's closely related to sampling and to testability. And really what's driving all of this is that there is an underlying structure, which is getting you from something that sounds very local to something that might sound a little more global, although not nearly as global as what I'm about to, to do in part two. Okay, but some of the main theorems here are that F converges for all convergent graph sequences if and only if it is a continuous function in the cut metric if and only if it's a testable graph parameter, and if and only if it can be uh, 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 extended to a continuous function on the limit object, which is just some uh, bounded symmetric function on the unit square, the graph on. Okay, so that seems like a lot of different ways of thinking about this, but if you come from stat mech, which we do, then it, it seemed to us that there were other reasonable ways of, of doing this. So, in part one, we learned that a graph sequence can be probed from the left, can be tested from the left by looking at the density of edges, the density of triangles, and so on. Okay, in part two, we're gonna learn that it can be probed from the right by studying 
generalized colorings or uh, uh, statistical mechanical models on the graph. So one way of studying the graph is very locally in terms of the density of little pieces of it. It's going to turn out that a graph can also be characterized by looking, or a sequence of graphs, by looking at how certain kinds of stat mech models act on this sequence. So it's a dual notion. Okay. So part one, we looked at homomorphisms of, we thought of a small graph into a large graph. Okay? Now we're going to consider homomorphisms of a large graph into a small graph. Okay? H is going to be a small weighted graph. And really what I want to think of H as is the graph which represents a statistical mechanics model. So the Easing model, for example, can be characterized by two, two edges, uh, two, two, two points representing a plus state and a minus state, and an edge that runs from one state to, to the other state. Okay? So the, the, um, this H is, is going to have some weights on the, on the nodes and weights on, um, and weights on the edges. Okay? And the homomorphism, the, 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 um, the size of, of, or the number of homomorphisms of G to H is just the sum over all the homomorphisms, the weight, the, the product of the weights on the, um, on the nodes and the weights on the edges. Okay? And what this really is is a weighted count of the number of colorings of the graph. Okay, so let's look at an example, the easing magnet. Okay, so here there are two vertices of my little probing graph H, the minus state and the plus state. The alphas are going to be the magnetic fields. Okay, so how much I weight the minus or weight the plus has to do with the magnetic field. And the edge is going to tell me the coupling from one state to the other state. And so the number of homomorphisms is just the sum of e to the minus energy, the sum over all, um, you know, um, uh, uh, all configurations of minus one and plus one of e to the minus energy, where the energy is the easing energy. Cheating a little bit here because the normalization of, of the, the energy is not the normalization we're used to. It's the normalization for a dense graph. So it grows like e to the n squared. I mean, I'm not really cheating, but I'm just warning you that it's going like e to the n squared. And because of that, the free energy is going to be the same, um, um, the same. In, in the limit, the free energy is going to be totally um, energy dominated, not entropy dominated, for those of you who know what I'm talking about, OK? Um, so this is one of the things that's easier for a dense graph. OK. so. We say that G is, uh, uh, is naively right convergent if we normalize properly by 1 over n squared. The, you know, the log of the number of homomorphisms, so this is like a free energy. Um, if this converges for all soft core weighted H's, so I'm not allowed to have any zeros on my edges, so I'm only looking at models where one state is allowed to be next to some other state. So I'm not looking at hardcore models where I can't place two ones next to each other. Okay, so the betas have to be non-zero. And the vertex weights also are all positive, so I'm not excluding any state. And the ground state energy of the model H is just, you know, one over the number, um, uh, the number of vertices squared times the minimum, and it's the minimum of this due to the fact that um, we're talking about a ground state energy. And, um, and it turns out that this kind of right convergence is the same as convergence of the ground state energy. So where, where do we stand now? We know from the first part of the talk that metric convergence is the same as left convergence, which is the subgraph density is converging, and is the same as uh, uh, testability, okay? 
So here we have a, a naive right convergence, which is that we're testing by these uh, uh, statistical mechanical models, non-hardcore statistical mechanical models. And this turns out to be the same thing as the um, ground state energies being Cauchy. Okay. And it turns out the ground state energy is, uh, uh, is a continuous function in the cut metric. So metric convergence also implies this. And similarly, the cut densities are, te are testable parameters. So we've got kind of everything flowing down here. What we'd like to do is to get things to flow back up there so that we have a uh, complete characterization. But it's not true, actually. So we, we have to do one other thing which, if you come from statistical mechanics, makes perfect sense. We have to look at the microcanonical ensemble. Okay. So, let's say that we are given Q color classes with a fraction AI of our sites in each color class. Okay. So, you know, I'm looking at the microcanonical ensemble where 60% of my spins are uh, are up, and 40% of my spins are down. Okay. And um, so the microcanonical homomorphism number is I'm, I'm fixing to a vector A, which says there are A1, you know, A, A1 fraction is in state one, A2 fraction is in state two, and so on, and the AIs add up to one. Okay, and so that's the, um, uh, the homomorphism number. And the microcanonical ground state energy, I just fix it so that I have the right number in each state. Okay, so this is the ground state energy. Given that, you know, I must have 40% in the plus state and 60% in the minus state or whatever. Okay, and so some examples um, from graph theory, the max, uh, the max bisection, and the reason this is the max bisection is because the entropy is wiped out, so the sum is the same as maxing. Um, if, if if you just look at what this is doing, um, this is saying that uh, what I want to do is I want to count um, one for every cut, and I want to max over that. And so this is actually giving me a cut density, and it's a bisection density because I'm taking A to be one half. So I'm saying that I have to have half of my nodes in, in one of the blobs and half of my nodes in the other blob. But I could say, you know, I want to divided into three pieces with 10% in one and 20% in another and 70% in another. And if, if you go through and look at it, this is just telling you the, the densest subgraph of size AV. This is going to pick that out for you. And so right convergence now, we say that um, GN is right convergent if, um, if, uh, um, the, the free energy uh, uh, converges, and it turns out that right convergence is the same as, uh, as convergence of the microcanonical ground state energies. The reason this is happening once more, for those of you who know what I'm talking about, is that there's no entropy here, so the free energy and the energy are doing the same thing, and the entropy just gets wiped out because it's order n. Okay, this turns out to be what we need to get back. Okay, so it turns out that if we look at this kind of right convergence for microcanonical ensembles or the microcanonical ground state energy, um, microcanonical ground state energy is converging. And we go through a lot of work, which is interesting in its own right, but I don't, don't have time to talk about it, which has to do with quotients modding out by the Semmeretti partitions in a natural Hausdorff metric. If we go through all of that, we can get back. So basically, looking at, um, you, you can test a graph by testing its edge, triangle, you know, whatever densities. You can test it by seeing that, um, it's, uh, it's converging in this metric, which is testing the, the cuts. You can look at how testable functions act on it, but you can also look at microcanonical statistical mechanics models on it, and that gives you 
those colorings that correspond to those microcanonical statistical mechanics models are giving you exactly the same information that these other things. So, and that's very non-local. I mean, it sounds very non-local, but it's giving you the same information as these very, very local things. And the reason all of this is happening is because by Semreddy, for large graphs, there's structure there. There's structure that you don't realize. Just combinatorially, there's structure there. So um, I think that Semreddy is really one of the deepest things that anybody has proved in the last, you know, 30 or 40 years because it just tells us that there's structure where we didn't think there was structure. And, I mean, this is just a manifestation of that, that very non-local things are in fact, are giving us, that all these very non-local things together give us the same information as all this very local stuff. Okay, so there's a reasonable notion of convergent graph sequences, which is Convergence of subgraph densities, as, as we learned in the first part, which is similar to the metric and to the sampling. Um, and convergence of subgraph densities also turns out to be the same as all these microcanonical ground state energies converging, which sounds very, very different and very non local. And um, the nice thing about all of this is that once you go through this, it's then possible to get easier proofs of a lot of results in graph theory and some new results in graph theory using these, these techniques, just working with the graph limit.